As crowds gathered to watch the dome at BC Place come down, Joe Perkins and a current CFLer reminisce about its storied past. For 25 years, it's been one of Vancouver's most defining structures, but on Tuesday, the white roof of BC Place was scheduled to come down. With workers and pedestrians all getting ready for the 11 a.m. deflation, one CFL football player was using the day to remember. Yeah, you grew up coming to games and hearing about BC Place and the Lions, this, that, and the other thing, and uh, you know, actually coming into the stadium and playing on the the concrete turf that we used to call it, and uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it was surreal. It was, it was a pretty amazing experience. Tuesday's deflation is the first step in a $458 million project between the province of BC and PAVCO, which will give BC Place a new retractable roof for 2011. With media scheduled to watch the deflation from a nearby rooftop, I asked Emery if he'd like to take part and watch the stadium he grew up in slowly go down. Yeah, it was the first time playing the Lions, and so I'm running around and all I see is these orange helmets and orange jerseys and stuff, and I'm like, whoa, I'm actually playing the Lions. Yeah. And he was playing them indoors under the old roof, which Emery says has never been easy. Uh, playing indoors is always a battle. It's always like the air is different and, you know, there's, there's always some sort of turf difference. As Vancouver takes in the last few moments of the White Dome, Emery knows it's not just football that BC Place will be remembered for. Vancouver did a really good job during the Olympics and uh, BC Place was a big part of that. And uh, I think people will remember the opening ceremonies when, uh, you know, they panned off to the to the, the roof and showed all the fireworks and stuff going off. I think that was pretty cool and uh, a lot of people are going to remember that. And they'll also remember today as the day the dome deflated. There's a lot of history that's happened in this dome and uh, you know so it's it's cool to be a part of it. Joe Perkins in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Joe Perkins now joins us live. Joe what can you tell us about the design of the new roof? Well, Sheet, I can tell you they're not just calling this a new roof. They're calling it a new BC place. After 25 years, the White Dome is officially out, replacing it the world's largest cable-supporting retractable roof. Now, the roof's not going to be completely exposed like many people think. Instead, there's going to be a 100 by 85 meter gap at the opening. It should take about 20 minutes to open, and that's good news heading into summer 2011 when the Lions and now the Whitecaps will both be taking the field. Shahid? Sounds like something sports fans in Vancouver will definitely enjoy. Maybe now for the most important question, Joe, what can you tell us about the costs of the roof? Well, Shahid, the cost of the roof is going to cost $458 million. Now, the province of BC has a approved the loan to PAVCO over the next 40 years, but it seems in the meantime, PAVCO is mainly self-financing the project. Obviously, they're hoping for some additional revenue to come in through sponsorships, concerts, things of this nature. I can tell you, though, that in the near future, with those fans out of BC Place, Energy costs at BC Place are going to go way down. They're cutting costs by $350,000. Sheet. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's take a look at a time-lapse video of the historic event recorded from the Canby Street Bridge. Joe, do you have any uh, favorite memories from BC Place? Well, Sheet, for me, it's got to be the opening ceremonies in February. But talking to people on Tuesday, a lot of memories. The first Whitecaps game in 83, 60,000 people. The Pope coming in 84, all the great cups and concerts. Definitely going to be missed, guys. Thanks, Joe. A young composer's non-traditional music has led him to international recognition. Alwena Shirley discovers why his style is so unusual. This young SFU student likes to play the guitar, but not in the way you would expect. James O'Callaghan also likes to play the piano. As a self-taught music composer at the age of 21, he has become internationally recognized. I've uh, got two orchestral readings of my two first orchestral pieces here in Vancouver and then in Victoria, so that was really exciting. And then I'm also going to a couple conferences this summer where I've got a piece in the International Computer Music Conference in New York. And then I'm presenting a paper in a, another electroacoustic conference in Shanghai. Just continues to blossom from there. A couple of years prior to coming to school, I started experimenting with 
electronica in my basement kind of thing, right? But I just kind of milled around, thought about doing visual art for a while, thought about doing acting, and then took a course in electroacoustic music, which I had never heard of. I thought it was just going to be like making slamming beats. But it uh, turned out it's, you know, this really interesting sort of sound-based medium. With a computer as his music sheet and a mouse as his pen, O'Callaghan continues to create film soundtracks, orchestra pieces, and new ways to play an instrument. Alwena Shirley in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Graffiti in the Park took place this week as part of Youth Week, and as Tessa Humphreys reports, one young man looked to promote the art of spray painting in the community. Graffiti artist Dennis Dvoryankin creates art, not vandalism. Dvoryankin and two friends created Graffiti in the Park, an event to teach young people the art of graffitiing. For community, it has uh, more of like an education purpose, you know, where some people might see graffiti as uh, vandalism, you know, while we try to promote more an artistic way of it, right, and um, have the kids actually come in and paint uh, without breaking the law, right, so it's a good opportunity. Dvoryankin gives a quick demo as one youth is unsure how her first spray painting piece will turn out. First of all, I really don't know how I'm going to put this on the canvas, but um, I'm thinking I'll start with the lighter colors here, probably her face, and then do the hair, and then do the light colors here, because they said to do dark colors after, so that's pretty much what I'm thinking I'm going to do. Williams isn't alone, as Dvoryankin says this is the first opportunity for many to paint. I think it's the best uh, to me, it's just pretty much an opportunity to get out and uh, work with some kids, uh, you know, uh, get them to try uh, some spray paint, right, and um, to get a chance to get their art, um, you know, uh, out on a board if they haven't done that before. As Williams becomes comfortable with spraying, Dvoriankin offers advice in hopes of promoting a future generation of true graffiti artists. So you kind of get the whole, kind of the basic idea of Tessa Humphreys in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Many people dream of living the life of a professional DJ, but as Allison Riley found out, it's not just about pressing play. They get the party started and make you want to bust a move. It's the DJ. As one of Vancouver's most booked and sought after DJs, Eric Carver knows what it takes to turn a passion for music into a successful career. To be a successful DJ uh, really depends on your defini definition of success, but basically um, either, either you, uh, you play a lot of shows, so you make a lot of money, or you do the shows you love and, and you, you know, grow from just starting out locally and then moving nationally and internationally. So I'm getting exposure like that. Eric just had the busiest year of his life playing over 150 shows, and he knows more than anyone that success doesn't happen overnight. He's been at this since 2003. You really got to know the music and you really got to know how to read a dance floor and crowds and just not play what everyone else is playing because that what to me that's what makes a DJ. Savio Ferreo is a partner and booker for Trust Events. He says that Eric is the complete package when it comes to booking DJs for important events. So at the end of the day he, he, he can play all that old school hip hop and then uh, and then and then also play all the different types of house music like vocal house and this other stuff. So, so he uh, most DJs can only play one or the other. He plays right through, like he can play everything. The biggest misconception about DJs is probably um, that it's easy. A lot of people think you just walk up and press play and uh, you know throw your hands in the air, but. Uh, yeah, I think it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice. You really got to know your music and what you're playing. In Vancouver, Allison Riley for BCIT Magazine. Up next on BCIT Magazine, we find out what it's like to be the conductor of the Metropolis Express. And a former professional soccer player is lacing up his boots with local youth, trying to take their game to the next level. Stay with us.